Hey everyone, uh, welcome to another uh, Underground Philosophy uh, broadcast. Uh, this time we're going to be reading Karl Popper, um, and yeah, it's still the Open Society and its enemies, of course, and, uh, and, and I've got the handy Kindle app here uh, to help me do it. So let me go ahead and configure this. I need the text to be just a little bit bigger um, so that I can read it. Uh, let's see. Probably too big. That looks about right. Okay. Um, so here we go. Uh, let's see. Are there any updates? I, I believe there is one update. Um, I, I had scheduled a bunch of broadcasts on Twitch this week, and then uh, and then just remembered uh, about that today. So my apologies, everyone, for not coming in and, and broadcasting uh, the way that I uh, actually accidentally said I would. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm going to try to do better about holding myself to a schedule in the future. and We'll see. I may have to move it around some uh, to get it to where I can actually do it, but whatever. Um, you may notice I've moved some things around. I've moved my desk into my living room and I'm just kind of hanging out in here now. Uh, but uh, yeah, let's see. I think that's actually about it. That's all that's changed. We're on chapter four this week, and, and uh, we're just going to go ahead and move through here. There, there should be some highlights in the first part of what I, I want to get through tonight. Um, yeah, I think maybe just chapter four, maybe chapter four and five, maybe just part of chapter four. It's been a while since I went back and looked through this stuff. And I think what I've decided to do, actually, is to switch over my style, and, and instead of just uh, going through, through and doing some highlights at first. I'm, I'm thinking let's actually uh, try, try to give the audience the, the full, um, the whole, whole shebang, so to speak, and uh, and just read through and, and maybe even make highlights and kind of explain why I highlight certain things and why not others. Um, but okay, yeah, let's dive right in. Here we go. Plato was one of the first social scientists and undoubtedly by far the most influential. Here's the Plato. What a guy. <laughs> in the sense in which the term sociology was understood by Comte, Mill, and Spencer, he was a sociologist. That is to say, he successfully applied his idealist method to an analysis of the social life of man and of the laws of its development, as well as the laws and conditions of its stability. In spite of Plato's great influence, this side of his teaching has been little noticed. It seems to be due to two factors. First of all, much of Plato's Plato's sociology is presented by him in such close connection with his ethical and political demands that the descriptive elements have been largely overlooked. Secondly, many of his thoughts were taken so much for granted that they were simply absorbed unconsciously and therefore uncritically. It is mainly in this way that his social, sociological theories became so influential. Um, so Popper is saying here that... Uh, the, the reason Plato is an influential sociologist um, has to do with the fact that nobody is critically evaluating his theories. Um, people are just kind of taking him, uh, if you will, as gospel. And, and that makes some amount of sense. I, I think that for the most part, that's not something you really want to do. Um, but I, I think I want to push this just a little bit further than Popper actually does. And, and, and for me as a philosopher, I think you could say that um, you know, people who unconsciously and or uncritically um, evaluate these texts and, and just kind of repeat the things that they hear are responsible for some, some issues. Uh, not just the popularity of sociology, <laughs> which I don't really have so much of a problem with as Popper does. But let's continue pushing on here. Um, we come to our first highlight. Uh, but on this idealist foundation, Plato constructs an astonishingly realistic theory of society capable of explaining the main trends in the historical development of the Greek city-states, as well as the social, social and political forces at work in his own day. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the main idea of the little intro of the chapter here. Then we've got a one, uh, and I believe it goes through five, uh, so, so these are just different sections of this chapter to make it easier for us to discuss. Um,
Okay, and we've got another highlight here. The forms or ideas are not only unchanging, indestructible, and incorruptible, but also perfect, true, real, and good. In fact, good is once in the Republic explained as everything that preserves, and evil is as everything that destroys or corrupts. The perfect and good forms or ideas are prior to the copies, the sensible things, and they are something like primogenitors or starting points of all the changes in the world of flux. This theory can be developed in detail. The more closely a sensible thing resembles its former idea, the less corruptible it must be, since the forms themselves are incorruptible. But sensible or generated things are not perfect copies. Indeed, no copy can be perfect, since it is only an imitation of the true reality, only appearance and illusion, not the truth. Accordingly, no sensible things, except perhaps the most excellent ones, resemble their forms sufficiently closely to be unchangeable. Absolute and eternal immutability is assigned only to the order of the most divine of all things, and bodies do not belong to this order, said Plato. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, you kind of get the idea what Popper's uh, got to say to us here about the forms. Um, he, he's explaining in some sense just the character of the run-of-the-mill theory of forms that we find some amount of support for in Plato, uh, in the language spoken by uh, Socrates in Plato's dialogues, that is. Um, but however, uh, we don't necessarily have perfect information on that regard. I'm, I'm not sure how much we've spoken about this in this series of videos, um, but the, the texts of Plato are not um, <laughs> completely preserved in history, and a lot of what, what produces uh, people's opinions about what Plato had to say um, is, is sort of this historical guessing game. And, and we do have some evidence, uh, things like the seventh letter and other letters Plato wrote, um, things other people wrote about Plato. Um, but, but really, truly, the problem is that, you know, Platonic philosophy has not entirely survived um, the, the crushing of, um, of history. And so we end up in a situation where we're, we're saying what Plato says, but we're also saying what we think Plato says at the, the same time, which... You know, I mean, postmodernism is true, and we are always doing that. But with regard to Plato, we, we don't necessarily even have as good of evidence uh, to, to make certain empirical claims about uh, his positions on various different matters as, as we would like to. Um, so moving right along here, um, any change whatsoever except for the change of an evil thing is the greatest of the gravest of all the treacherous dangers that can befall a thing, whether it is now a change of season or of wind or of the diet of the body or of the character of the soul. And he adds, for the sake of emphasis, this statement applies to everything, with the sole exception, as I said just now, of something evil. In brief, Plato teaches that change is evil and that rest is divine. Um, and, and that, that's a bit puzzling, right? Because a lot, a lot of what we think of is, uh, is good today, at least um, in, in ter terms of politics, right, is, is this idea of progress. Um, progressives support progress in terms of things like technology, um, in terms of medicine, in ter terms of uh, social safety for individual members of our society. Um, and, and the idea is that there's a more ideal state than the current state. And if we all sort of chip in, then we can work towards uh, the creation of, uh, you know, as, as the Constitution says, a more perfect union. Um, so, so the view that's being given air here um, is not a view that we can really take seriously, Popper says, uh, in modern politics, right? We have these ideas of, of things that need to happen, and we know that we need to change the system so that these things come about. So what's ridiculous in Plato at this point um, is that he is calling change unequivocally bad, which is what we might think of as like sort of a foundational stance of um, conservative political uh, orientations. However, there, there is one issue with um, 
with that, which is that we don't know if Plato was serious. We know that he had Socrates say these things, um, but the things that Socrates says generally don't unpack to their simplistic, literal meaning. Um, they're, they're more dialectical than that. And, and so when you, when you take into account the fact that the, the quotes that Popper is pulling out are not designed to be sound bites, but rather they're, they're part of a um, dialectical web of argumentation that, that initially at least seems to have been designed to suggest something that it doesn't ever explicitly say to the reader. Um, yeah, anyway, I, I, th I think there's just more complexity here than Popper wants to uh, necessarily and immediately sort of um, tell us, right? So he says, we see now that Plato's theory of forms or ideas implies a certain trend in the development of the world in flux. It leads to the law that the corruptibility of all things in that world must continually increase. What does this sound like? It sounds like entropy, right? That's fascinating. <laughs> um, but, but entropy is a more sophisticated explanation um, that's more tied to empirical, measurable phenomena, right? Um, for, for Plato, it, this idea that everything starts off more or less like this perfect idea um, and then kind of goes downhill from there is, is well, one-dimensional, to say the least. Um, so thus it is possible, as the last quotations indicate, that a very good soul may defy change and decay, and that a very evil thing, for instance, a very evil city, may be improved by changing it. In order that such an improvement should be of any value, we would have to try to make it permanent, i.e., to arrest all further change. And, and this is something that we see in conservative politics today, right? The idea of conservatism is this idea that we need to conserve what we have um, to arrest future change. You, you want to make things stay the same. If you look at the, the moves by Mitch McConnell in 2020, the, the Donald Trump, uh, you know, uh, appointees to, um, to all, the, all the judge uh, seats um, on the Supreme Court and in the federal um, circuit appeals, and so on and so forth. There, there are lots of Trump judges, and the, the idea is that um, what they want to do is prevent anyone from coming in and saying, uh, we need to be less religious, or uh, we, we need to be more anti-gun, or we need to um, create these certain patterns of, of difference uh, to make our society more ideal than it currently is. Um, and, and these people, I guess, are operating under the assumption, um, as Popper is highlighting in Plato here, uh, although that may just be a, a position that Socrates was taking to prove a point to his interlocutor, um, you know, uh, change is, is something that is not necessarily as bad as everybody is saying. Um, and we don't necessarily have reason to believe um, that it would be bad either. So... so I don't know. Uh, let's let's move on just a little bit here. If we are to believe Aristotle's report outlined in the last chapter, then the theory of forms or ideas was originally introduced in order to meet a methodological demand, the demand for pure or rational knowledge, which is impossible in the case of sensible things in flux. We now see that the theory does more than that. Over and above meeting these methodological demands, it provides a theory of change. If, as I believe, the philosophies of Plato as well as Heraclitus sprang from their social experience, especially from the experience of class war, and from the abject feeling that their social world was going to pieces, then we can understand why the theory of forms came to play such an important part in Plato's philosophy when he found that it was capable of explaining the a trend towards degeneration. And is it really capable of explaining the trend towards generation? Well, I, I, I th or towards de degeneration. I, I, I think there is a good reason for us to believe that maybe it doesn't do a very good job of supporting that trend. And, and maybe that trend isn't really something that we can always observe the, the way these people uh, 
Plato and Heraclitus um, seemed to believe it uh, to be. He saw uh, things which had not been seen before him and which were rediscovered only in our own time. As an example, I may mention his theory of the primitive beginnings of society, of tribal patriarchy, and in, in general, his attempt to outline the typical periods and the development of social life. Um, and, and so, yeah, I mean, there, there is this sense in which what Plato is up to, for Popper at the very least, is this creation of something like a scientific um, study of, let's see, I guess we're just out of highlights here, of, um, of sociology, or of uh, social life. So l let me go ahead and, uh, and I'm, I'm just going to hop off for a second, take a quick break. I will be right back.
Right. I'm back. Um, sorry about that. Sometimes uh, life doesn't pause for us when we want to stream, so uh, I have to leave to do phone calls or, or whatever. Um, let's see. I was thinking I'd highlighted further. I wonder if there just wasn't anything good in this section. <laughs> I, I don't think that's the case. I, I think I just uh, didn't didn't make it quite as far, or maybe it hasn't updated yet. Um, but like I like I was thinking at the beginning of the stream, we we may have to kind of move uh, move through. I mean, I'm going to try my best to move fairly rapidly through this because I, I don't I don't think the core substance of what pop Popper has to say to us is um, necessarily about to be presented here, but but this reading of Plato is rather instructive, and it, and I think uh, there's an opportunity for uh, for me to make it a bit more instructive just by sort of um, explaining some of the the history and so on that that surround this. Um, so let's keep moving along here. Um, we've got the dialogues in which uh, Plato discusses. These questions are in chronological order. The Republic, the dialogue of much, much later date called the States, Statesman or the Politicus, and the, the Laws, the latest and longest of his works. In spite of certain minor differences, there is much agreement between these dialogues, which are, are in some respects parallel, in others complementary to one another. Um, and, and, okay, so, so, so we, we've got Statesman, we've got Laws, and we've got Republic here. We, we also discussed Timaeus. Um, and, and most of these guys aren't dialogues that your philosophy professors really want you to read when you're in undergrad. Um, I have read all of them and um, I mean really honestly um, there, there isn't just a ton of support for the theory of uh, forms the way the Popper wants to outline it as. Um, and I, I believe there are actually points in which, uh, maybe that was the, at the end of chapter three, um, but, but I am kind of having some formal issue with the, the podcast here, um, or with these videos, and, and I need to, I, I guess, kind of get things straight. Um, I, I've taken a, about a week off from doing this here, maybe 10 days uh, for Thanksgiving, and, and so I'm kind of getting back into it, but, you know, like so many other things, I, I find it's a, a bit rusty here. Um, so I apologize about that. Um, been, been doing some work on my space here as well. Um, so, so there's really a lot of change happening. Um, but yes, according to the Republic, the original or primitive form of society, and at the same time the one that resembles the former idea of a state most closely, the best state, is a kingship of the wisest and most godlike of men. <clears throat> so, so there are two senses in which this is ideal. One is that you know, you've got this structure which uh, which emerges from, uh, you know, a kingship of the wisest and most godlike of men. But but you also have a sense in which um, this is idealistic, right? Uh, it, it's not it's not reasonable to expect uh, that you can get that all the time. Um, and and so I, I think that's one issue. But but here let's uh, let's look at this uh, this other session here. Um, but we've got uh, the four most conspicuous periods or landmarks in the history of political degeneration and at the same time the most important varieties of existing states are described by Plato in the following order. First after the perfect state comes timarchy or democracy, the rule of the noble who seeks honor and fame. Secondly, oligarchy, the rule of rich families. Next in order, democracy is born, the rule of liberty which means lawlessness. And last comes tyranny, the fourth and final sickness of the city. Um, yeah, and, and it's funny um, to think about this in terms of uh, of the American situation, right? <laughs> because, I mean, I think you could honestly say that uh, some of the founding fathers were Timocrats. You know, they were, uh, they, they were seeking honor and fame. And, and they structured their lives around sort of that concept and then you know maybe I don't know maybe the late 1800s early 1900s uh, you end up with uh, you know oligarchy so the rule of the rich families although I'm not sure how closely the presidents were tied to uh, say the Rockefellers right I'm, 
I'm sure there was some relationship there, but, you know, just being loose with this and, and being upfront about the fact that we're loose about it. Then, then you've got the uh, rule of liberty. Um, so democracy uh, would be probably the period from like the 1940s through the 1980s or 1990s. And, and then tyranny, uh, which, you know, we, we probably just survived our closest brush with yet <laughs> as a society. Society. So here's to us. Good job, America. Although we may not be out of the woods. <clears throat> so let's see. As can be seen from the last remark, Plato looks upon history, which to him is a history of social decay, as if it were the history of an illness. The patient is society, and as we shall see later, the statesman ought to be a physician, and vice versa, versa a healer or a savior. Before discussing Plato's perfect state in any detail, I shall give a brief sketch of his analysis of the role played by economic motives in the class struggle in the process of transition between the four decaying forms of the state. The first form into which the perfect state degenerates, democracy, is the rule of ambitious noblemen, is said to be in nearly all respects similar to the perfect state itself. Um, it is important to note that Plato explicitly identified this best and oldest among the existing states with the Dorian constitution of Sparta and Crete, and that these tri two tribal aristocracies did, in fact, represent the oldest existing forms of political life within Greece. Um, is that fascinating? Uh, but, but, you know, um, what we're just going through the Republic here, right? So, so we're reading Karl Popper, um, and what he's saying isn't, um, so it isn't particularly um, controversial. Uh, we've got, they, the Democrats, believe by, or begin by creating opportunities for showing off and spending money, and to this end they twist the laws, and then their laws, uh, or excuse me, and then their wives disobey them, and they try to outrival one another. In this way, or as is the first class conflict, Popper wants to say, that between virtue and money, or between the old established ways of feudal simplicity and the new ways of wealth. Interesting. Uh, let's see. Oh yeah, and this is <laughs> this this is cool. Um, Plato's description of the genesis of the democratic man, Adam Wright, is one of the most royal and magnificent pieces of writing in the whole range of literature, whether ancient or modern. And when the same writer continues, the democracy of the democratic man is the chameleon of the human society. Paint him for all time. Then we see that Plato has succeeded, at least, in turning his thinker against democracy. And we may wonder how much damage his poisonous writing has done when presented unopposed to lesser minds. And that's that's a a bit pessimistic, if you ask me. Um, I, I don't know that damage is really done by presenting falsehoods to, to lesser minds. I, I want to say that I don't know. Um, if, if we're being platonic or Aristotelian about this and, and trying to um, sort of classify minds in terms of size as if that were a reasonable thing to do, um, I, I think it's possible that one one of the things that we're missing out on is sort of the interconnectedness of minds. Um, and, and I think that in that sense, it's possible that uh, people support one another. Um, and, and it's, you know, not necessarily all as degenerative as, as we've got here. Um, although some of this is Popper and some of this is Plato, right? So, so I, I think to some extent, Popper is uh, using his reading of Plato to create his own sort of narrative, and and in that sense, we're we're not necessarily getting the most I don't know straightforward, scholarly, honest uh, evaluation of what Plato has to say. I, I think the same thing happens somewhat less prob uh, problematically when we get to Hegel and start dealing with that. Hmm. Okay. But moving right along here, um,
Yeah, and, and this this passage is is about slavery, which yes, I mean I know that's a problematic uh, thing. Um, well, one of the things that I actually was having a conversation with a friend of mine the other night, and and you know um, I, I think it's possible to fault Plato and Aristotle and a lot of people for having kind of an undeveloped uh, moral code with regard to things like slavery um, and even you know just class. Uh, intellect and so on um they, they, they were harsh you know they, they were uh and and there are a few narratives that are interesting to me on that front um i believe socrates was a famous soldier who um had just remarkable endurance and was just a very strong person um plato uh well platon i believe is is a greek word for broad <laughs> and plato supposedly won the olympics for wrestling twice um, and, and Aristotle studied under Plato for like 20 years and was Alexander the Great's um, teacher. So, so I think, you know, looking at the lineage of, of, these, uh, of these men, you know, there, there's definitely a sense in which uh, cruelty is, is something that, that we're likely to find uh, for them, you know. And, and that's a value that they have to one extent or another that we don't have to that same extent. So that, that's an important thing to notice. Um, but that being said, I, I, I'm not terribly interested um, in that side of, of what Plato had to say. I think we can, we can view it, we can catalog it as sort of a, as a moment um, in history that happened. Um, and, and we can be aware of it, um, but we can't necessarily do anything to change that. So, so I I will absolutely agree with uh, with Popper um, on, on the fact that you know uh, Plato and Aristotle were being inhuman. Uh, let's just let's read this last sentence. It will forever remain one of the greatest triumphs of Athenian demo democracy that it treated slaves humanely, and that in spite of the inhuman propaganda of philosophers like Plato himself and Aristotle, it came as he witnesses very close to abolishing slavery. Um, so good for them. Uh, yeah, kind of moving along here, though, looking, looking for something that touches on sort of the critique um, that Popper is doing here. Um, yes, okay. A very similar survey of the various forms of, of government can be found in the Statesman, where Plato discusses the origin of the tyrant and king, of oligarchies and aristocracies, and of democracies. Again, we find that the various forms of existing governments are explained as debased copies of the true model or form of the state, of the perfect state, the standard of all imitations, which is said to have existed in the ancient times of Kronos, father of Zeus. One of the charges that Socrates faced before he was killed was atheism. Um, so I'm a bit fascinated here to see Popper... Um, looking at, at uh, the Greek history uncritically, so to speak, and and not making a big difference to uh, or a big uh, effort to sort of separate Plato um, from the state in which he lived on that point in particular. Um, okay, um, yeah, it is especially because. Um, most of the people in that society were abolitionists, and Plato was, I guess, um, on the slavery side of th things, which is to some extent sensible because he's an aristocrat, but as Popper says, to some extent that's unforgivable um, because, you know, I mean, it's it's just um, it's so unfortunate, right? I mean, Plato should have known better. He should have done better. Um But yeah, I mean, so so why bring that up, but but then not um, speak more about the, this other break uh, between Plato and and his state? Um. um anyway, uh, but but okay. So so moving right along here. But democracy changes into its lawless form and deteriorates further through oligarchy, the lawless rule of the few into a lawless rule of one, the one, tyranny, which, just as Plato has said in the Republic, is the worst of all. Um, 
Yeah, and, and tyranny, you know, I mean, it's not a very stable form of government. Um, so the, the most evil state is tyranny down here. Um, yeah. Give me a state governed by a young tyrant, exclaims Plato there, who, who has the good fortune to be the contemporary of a great legislator and to meet him by some happy accident. What more could a god do for a city which he wants to make happy? Tyranny, the most evil state, may be reformed in this way. And so we do have sort of um, this sense in which there, there is this analysis is taking place in Plato. Um, but we have to, to some extent, figure out what Plato's primary motivation is here. Is Plato interested in the dialectic? Um, is Plato interested in promoting his own views? Um, and, and then there's sort of the third possibility, right, which is that Plato's writing from memory and trying to be, um, to some extent, faithful to what Socrates has to say. And, and we know from reading him that, that Plato's not, not entirely faithful on that front, but to what extent does he manage it um, is a very, very good question that we can ask here. And, and there isn't really necessarily an answer to that yet. I say yeah. Yet, but it's not clear that there ever will be a solid answer for that, that question. Um, so moving right along, just starting up uh, section three here. Um, Plato's description of the best or, perf or of the perfect or best state has usually been interpreted as the utopian program of a progressivist. In spite of his repeated assertions in the Republic of Timaeus and Creus that he is describing the diff distant past. And in spite of the parallel passages in the laws whose historical intention is to is manifest, it is often assumed that it, it was his intention to give a veiled description of the future. But I think that Plato meant what he said, and that many of the or and that many characteristics of his best state, especially as described in books two to four of the Republic, are intended like his accounts of primitive society and the statesmen and the laws to be historical or perhaps prehistorical. This may not apply to all characteristics of the best state. And and I, I think there's um, some sense in which this is this is Greek tragedy that, that we're encountering here because the the way that the stories of Homer and Hesiod worked, um, it is it it almost strikes me that, that what Plato's doing in his dialogue is creating a, a similar sort of narrative for Socrates. And, and so the story of Socrates is a tragedy, um, just as the stories that Homer wrote were. Anyway, uh, just kind of a, a shower thought here. Um, let's see. Move along a little bit further. We're, we're talking about um, arresting the development of the state and uh, and sort of holding it, um, but but it seems that as though uh, you know it, nobody's ever successfully done that. And Plato Plato would have a hard time making this argument um, that, that you know uh, historically the more perfect states were less um, likely to change because in the sense of history we know that they all did change. So none of them were actually perfect, and they've all degenerated. Um, unto the present, um, if we're taking that narrative seriously, which I'm still not convinced that we should. Uh, yeah, but but you know um, there is a pedagogical reason for which I, I could see Plato making this argument about there having been the best state. Um, so so again, I I, f I feel that um, you know sort of sort of the infamous. Uh, reading of Plato that we're finding in these passages is, um, is you know, uh, th this is something that, that you should definitely sit down and read, um, but, but it's not necessarily the best uh, thing to spend all of our time on um, in these videos, um, because our primary interest is in uh, more, more or less, uh, I would say, that the Hegel critique than the Plato critique, right? Um, and, and in Popper's own words, like, like these critiques themselves are uh, not necessarily the, the brightest part of this work uh, for us to focus upon. Yeah, here, the communism 
criticism of the ruling caste of his best city can thus be derived from Plato's fundamental sociological law of change. It is a necessary condition of the political stability, which is its fundamental characteristic, but although an important condition, it is not a sufficient one. In order that the ruling class may feel really united, that it should feel like one tribe, i.e. like one big family, pressure from without the class is as necessary as are the ties between the members of the class. Um, and, and so this is it's not really a social um, structure that comes from outside people. This is a, a normal web of human relationships, and insofar as it's a healthy web of relationships, the outcome is good, I would suppose. Um, yeah. Um, most, most people in civilized countries nowadays admit racial superiority to be a myth, but even if it were an established fact, it should not create special political rights, though it might create special moral responsibilities for the superior persons. Strange. Before proceeding to this description, I wish to express my belief that personal superiority, whether racial or intellectual or moral or educational, can never establish a claim to political prerogatives even if such superiority could be ascertained. Um, oh, okay, yeah, so, um, yeah. Yeah, if, if we're comparing and contrasting people's strengths and weaknesses, uh, race is kind of this made-up category that doesn't really exist um, in any measurable sense of the word. Um, so, so, you know, maybe culture would allow us to make certain... Uh, observations about differences between populations but but generally speaking uh, these types of inference from the general down to the level of the particular are just uh, very very likely to be completely flawed um, I, I, deal, I deal with that a little bit in, in my, my work formal dialectics um, and and basically well, let's actually just kind of let that go for now so Moving right along here, if we want to understand Plato's views about the origin, breeding, and education of his ruling class, we must not lose sight of the two main points of our analysis. We must keep in mind, first of all, that Plato is con uh, reconstructing a city of the past, although one connected with the present in such a way that certain of its features are still discernible in existing states, for example, in Sparta. And secondly, he is reconstructing his city with a view to the conditions of its stability, and that he seeks the guarantees for this stability solely within the ruling class itself, and more especially in its unity and strength. Right, so, so Plato believes that the actions taken by the ruling class are necessary for um, the unity and strength of a city. Um, regarding the origin of the ruling class, it may be mentioned that Plato speaks in the states, of a time prior to that of his best state when God himself was the shepherd of men ruling over them exactly as man still rules over the beast there was no ownership of women and children this is not merely the simile of the good shepherd in the light of what Plato says in the laws it must be interpreted more literally than that for there we are told that this primitive society which is prior even to the first and best city is one of nomad hill shepherds under a patriarch. Government originated, says Plato, there of the period prior to the first settlement, as the rule of the eldest, who inherited his authority from his father or mother. All the others followed him like a flock of birds, thus forming one single horde ruled by that patriarchal authority and kingship, which of all kingships is the most just. These nomad tribes we hear settled in the cities of the Peloponnese, especially in Sparta, under the name of Dorians. How this happened is not very clearly explained, but we understand Plato's reluctance when we get a hint that the settlement was in fact a violent subjugation. This, for all we know, is the true story of the Dorian settlement in the Pel Peloponnese. We therefore have every reason to believe that Plato intended his story as a serious description of prehistoric events, as a description not only of the origin of the Dorian master race, 
but also of the origin of their human cattle, i.e. the original inhabitants. In a parallel passage in the Republic, Plato gives us a mythological yet very pointed description of the conquest itself when dealing with the origin of the earthborn, the ruling class of the best city. Fascinating. Um, Yeah, so if we're tying real history in, um, which, which we don't know whether we are or not, then, then this is uh, this is definitely important stuff. Um, yeah. But okay. Um, let's go back one page here. Uh, yeah, and so so we're looking at sort of the uh, the, the various different types of people this city uh, for Plato. This, this is talked about in the Republic. This is um, uh, I mean, I don't know. It, it's reasonably fascinating but, but to me it seems uh, uh, beside the point to some extent. Um, but because we don't really have all that much information about uh, what you know what, what was actually going on here in terms of uh, Plato's goals with this text, right? Um, yeah, we've got the warriors, and, and there's the different metals that people, you know, uh, made out of. So the myth of the metals, and and to me it seems almost as if, uh, you know, this this is a little bit like coach talk, right? <laughs> what kind of metal are you made out of, son? Now get up there and give me 50 laps, you know, do do 50 push-ups while you're at it. It, it sounds like, uh, yeah, I mean, it's kind of this uh, jock-soldier talk to some extent. And and I, I don't want to write that off, but but at the same time, the, this, the critical analysis that we're spending on this could potentially be better spent on something that was meant to be taken uh, more seriously. Although I, I could certainly be wrong about that, so, so feel free to disagree with me, um, and and give your give this a uh, a thorough reading yourself. Um, but but I, I wasn't that interested in in this in the Republic, and I'm not that interested in it uh, here, uh, reappearing in in Popper's book. Um, although this is this is worth worth taking up for a second, Plato's educational aim is exactly the same. It is the purely political aim of stabilizing the state by blending a fierce and a gentle element in the character of the rulers, the two disciplines in which children of the Greek upper class were educated, gymnastics and music, the latter in the wider sense of the word, in included all literary studies, are correlated by Plato with the two elements of character, fierceness and gentleness. Have you not observed, asked Plato, how the character is affected by an exclusive training in gymnastics without music, and how it is if affected by the opposite training. Exclusive preoccupation with gymnastics produces men who are fiercer than they ought to be, while an analogous preoccupation with music makes them too soft. Anyway, um, so, so, yeah, I mean, we're, we're getting into, like, all this kind of uh, wannabe, hairy, theoretical stuff that doesn't really, I mean, I don't know, Plato, I guess, is kind of anti-music in the Republic, or, or he says certain people shouldn't listen to music, and, and I just, uh, I just can't hear that, <laughs> you know, um, but yeah, this, this is good stuff, um, moving right along to kind of get back to the core of this, uh, yeah, here we go, this is an outline of Plato's theory of the best or most ancient state of the city which treats its human cattle exactly as a wise but hardened shepherd treats its sheep not too cruelly but with the proper contempt as an analysis of both Spartan social institutions and of the conditions of their stability and instability and as an attempt at reconstructing more, more rigid and primitive forms of tribal life this description is excellent indeed only the descriptive aspect is dealt with in this chapter. The ethical aspects will be discussed later. Yeah, and that description was uh, 
quite uh, thorough. <laughs> oh, man. But, but yeah, so, so Plato talks a lot about the organization of the state. Um, the thing that Popper isn't really focusing on here is the context in which these discussions have happened and who is uh, doing the speaking. So it, it still remains a bit of a muddle. Um, let's see. To sum up, in an attempt to understand and to interpret the changing social world as he experienced it, Plato was led to develop a systematic historicist sociology in great detail. He thought of existing states as decaying copies of an unchanging former idea. Again, I think Popper's just pushing this a little bit too hard. Um, or maybe a lot too hard. <laughs> um, he tried to reconstruct this former idea of a state, or at least to describe a society which resembled it as closely as possible. Along with ancient traditions, he used as material for his reconstruction the results of his analysis of the, the social institutions of Sparta and Crete, the most famous uh, form uh, the most ancient forms of social life he could find in Greece, in which he recognized arrested forms of even older tribal societies. Interesting. I mean, huh. So he, he's recognizing arrested forms of older tribal societies in his society, but he's not drawing the conclusion that those are somehow the best forms of, of those societies. Everything else was evil and therefore corruptible. Um, and that's why it's gone. I mean, I don't know. It just, it, it seems like if Popper's uh, faithfully reading Plato here, which I, I, I would say it's an almost uh, certainty that the, the meaning that Popper's going for is not the meaning that Plato was going for with this stuff. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, I'll I'll start talking about that so much and just kind of kind of push through the text a little bit more because I, I, my intention with this is is not to tell the reader what to think about it. It's 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 more to to work through it sort of on my own. And uh, one one of the things that I do do sometimes uh, when I am working through a, a new book is I, I have to let certain uh, certain sections kind of go, or, or maybe you know you, you kind of give it one of these and and uh, skim certain sections. Um, I don't know. I, I do. I, I deeply love this book, though. Uh, but but this one section is is not the best. Um, yeah. Interpreting existing society or existing societies as decadent copies of an ideal state, Plato furnished Hesiod's somewhat crude, view, crude views of human history at once with a theoretical background and with a wealth of practical application. He developed a remarkably realistic historicist theory, which found the cause of social change in Heraclitus' disunion and in the strife of classes in which he recognized the driving as well as the corrupting forces of history. Hmm. Yeah. All this, I think, can be interpreted as an attempt and a most impressive one to explain and to rationalize his experience of the breakdown of the tribal society and an experience analogous to that which had led Heraclitus to develop the first philosophy of change. But our analysis of Plato's descriptive sociology is still incomplete. His stories of the decline and fall, and with it nearly all the later stories, exhibit at least two characteristics which we have not discussed thus far. Um, he conceived these declining societies as some kind of organism, and the decline is a process similar to aging. He believed that the decline is well, uh, well deserved in the sense that moral decay, a fallen decline of the soul, goes hand in hand with that of the social body. All this plays an important role in Plato's theory of the first change, in the story of the number and of the fall of man. This theory and its connection with the doctrine of forms or ideas will be discussed in the next chapter. Fascinating. Uh, so I, I guess I, I learned something, uh, which is that I hadn't read all that far yet. <laughs> um, but, but also I'm, I'm remembering the book a little bit more clearly. And, and I think a lot of times this happens when we go back and, and read something that we 
you know, haven't read in, in some time. Uh, so in terms of reflections, as, as far as that chapter goes, I, I, I think maybe, maybe it wasn't the best chapter, <laughs> um, but there was some pretty good stuff at the beginning. And, um, yeah, I'm really, really kind of looking forward to uh, moving on to the next one and, and kind of putting this one behind us because it's just kind of a brutal slog of a chapter. And, and really, um, I don't know. Uh, lo looking back, I kind of wonder if, if maybe there's something I could do to change my behavior and, uh, and, and just, you know, sit down and just stream through it and, and just, uh, just go through that stuff instead of doing what I've done for the past week week or so and, and procrastinating so uh i'm, I'm actually going to go ahead and end this stream I, I feel tired for some reason um and i'm not sure when the next one will be um or if i might switch to instagram or possibly even youtube live uh to do this kind of stuff so i'm going to be looking into that and scoping out that side of it quite a bit also at serious philosophy uh, so medium.com slash serious dash philosophy. Um, what we're starting a couple of new discussions and that that's going really well. So I'm excited about that. Uh, feel free to follow along with us there. Um, yeah. And, 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 and thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, cheers. And until, uh, until next time. See you later.